Eternal God, we have gathered with a spirit of humility, with open hearts. Be our nurturing guide that we may grow and serve in ways of trust, compassion, and purposeful living. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A few weeks ago, I was in Sedona, and as I walked around the hotel lobby, a sign on the registration desk caught my eye. The sign said, World Peace Meditation Meeting Canceled. And like you, I looked at that sign and it made me laugh. But the more that I looked at it and the more I thought about what it said, it seemed to me to be an editorial comment on the state of our world today. Anytime you pick up a newspaper or listen to the, ro the news on the radio or television, the news is alarming. Our world is in a mess. And somehow, in the world in which we live, with all its chaos and confusion, we are called to celebrate, to celebrate communion. Although it was a different place and time, and in many ways it was much the same in Jesus' time. The world was indeed a mess when Jesus went to the upper room. The Passover was not an insignificant celebration, and the question about where to have it probed the very depths of its mystery. To this day, the Passover remains the most prominent acknowledgement of what happens when God intervenes directly into the course of human history providing leadership where none exist, accomplishing human liberation where fear and oppression appeared to reign supreme, outsmarting the apparent wisdom of the ages and outperforming the powers that be. What made the location so important was that the context of life in Israel was every bit as tragic and inhumane as it had been so long ago in Egypt. Yes, it was a different form of bondage. Freedom of speech was denied, and freedom assem of assembly was not permitted. But make no mistake, the bondage was as physical as it was intellectual, and the oppression was every bit as spiritual as it was social. If there ever was a need for God to intervene directly, dramatically in human history, it was then, as the earth teetered on the brink of the most savage moment in all of history, when man's inhumanity to man was about to vent its fury on God, on the Son of God. The question itself was surely not as well crafted as the ages have made it sound, confident in the midst of peril, as though the relationship between the secular and the sacred was of little consequence. This question of where to celebrate the Passover was huge. It was tantamount to saying, while the world is going to hell, where shall we celebrate the realities of heaven? Perhaps it came out in bits and pieces with nervous caution. The Passover, shall we celebrate? If so, where shall we prepare for you to celebrate the Passover? Behold, the upper room. That is so much more than just a sermon title. It is a call to all of civilization, and it goes like this. When barbarism erupts with violent revenge in all corners of the world's population, is the upper room a hiding place or a place of preparation? They say that our most primitive response to crisis one that is innately a part of the animal kingdom, is fight or flight. To, fi to face the crisis and take it on, or to run away and hide and hope to live to fight another day. And so I am compelled to ask, was the upper room for Jesus a place to hide from the powers that were hell-bent on destroying him? Or was it the place to which he retreated to launch the most powerful spiritual offensive against the forces of evil that the world has ever known. We 
know that Jesus saw the Passover as unique because of the way he understood himself as the Passover lamb that would be slain for the liberation of human life. And therefore, I believe he gathered the disciples together in an upper room to prepare them and the ages of the faithful who would follow to battle in humanity wherever it raises its evil head with the kind of spiritual resolve that comes from God. And therefore, I wonder, I wonder how far Jesus could see into the future on that night in the upper room when he took bread and broke it, when he poured out his life like wine pouring into a chalice. Could he see a time when civilization would begin to crumble when ethnic hatred would fester for decades until extinction would seem the only inevitable outcome, when strategies of colonization would violate the cultural uniqueness of humanity, until cries for independence would be heard among the liberated. Could he see a time when crumbled empires would rise up in all their brokenness and fight for a glory that is forever gone or was never meant to be? when the wealth of a few would require the poverty of the vast majority in order to be sustained, when God would be forsaken by those who lead and faith would be trampled on as a vestige of days gone by. So many questions, so many questions I would ask of Jesus if only I could, wanting to know, needing to know. Could he see our world when he prepared for spiritual warfare in his world? that night in the upper room. And if so, and I believe he could, when he transformed a Passover celebration into a sacramental experience, was he empowering us all for the epic fight between good and evil? Is this dream of world communion the very experience we need to take on evil and defeat it once and for all? Was Jesus showing us? No. No, is he still showing us in sacramental mystery that the battle between good and evil is not a physical one to be determined on the battlefield of history, but a spiritual one that is one with resilience and resolve? Perhaps you saw the contrast between a world at communion and a world at war last month as Pope Francis weighed in on the world's many violent eruptions. The title of the article in the newspaper read, Pope Says World's Many Conflicts Amount to Piecemeal World War III. And the picture accompanying the article showed the Pope in Italy's largest war memorial where more than 100,000 soldiers died and are buried from the First World War. His words of a Third World War were offered there in a homily where he celebrated Mass. And there it is again the celebration of Mass, the mystery, Emmanuel, God with us in human struggle to stack the odds on the side of good in the offensive against evil. At times the Pope speaks for God to Roman Catholics, and at times he speaks for God to all of us. Humanity needs to weep, he said, and this is the time to weep. War is madness. And yet, even today, after the second failure of another world war, perhaps one can speak of a third, fought piecemeal with crimes and massacres and destruction. Every soldier who has seen combat knows that it's hell. And these are the words of the spiritual leader of the world's Catholic Christian population, trying to hold together the spirit of humanity called up to bear arms. His homily was delivered to thousands of brave souls who stood in the pouring rain to celebrate Mass with him there. And to some, it may have seemed as though even God was reigning on his parade. But I suspect that somewhere, somewhere the fires of hell were being extinguished so that the dream of world communion could yet come true. For rain is a symbol of God's spirit descending upon us all. Remember Romans 12, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil. Take the offensive and overcome evil with good. 
in the worst of times, in the darkest hour of human history, Jesus used a sacramental experience to keep the faithful to God for all eternity. And in that time of hatred, love triumphs over fear. Faith persevered over doubt. Hope was born in an upper room, and 2,000 years later, that hope lives on. Today, today we are called to celebrate communion, not to hide from the world, but to prepare each of us to live as spiritual beings in the world so that we may carry forward the good news of God's amazing grace. Let us prepare.